This is Supra Supreme, where we are transforming a stock Mark IV Turbo Supra into my dream build, using a Toyota V12 just like Smokey Nagata did, but with more of everything. Coming up, we have the biggest custom billet part yet, along with these billet parts, and a frickin' billet computer! Last episode, we came up with a new intake manifold design, and I've printed the rest of the pieces of it out. Uh, unfortunately, it did not clear the hood, so I've stripped the uh, underlay off the bottom of it, and we're gonna give it another go and see if it fits. Okay, it's been a few weeks. I've remodeled all of that stuff. So the intake manifold doesn't hit the hood anymore. This is basically what happened. We went from this really tall throttle collector to this uh, one that bends out heaps earlier and that's fixed the problem. Um, now, let's talk about color. In the last episode, we asked you to tell us what color scheme you would do on our billet intake manifold. And here are some of the more interesting answers. And I'm giving a fist bump to these two champs who were pretty damn close. I've got a dingle ball. Go, show us what you got. This is actually the best day of my life. Well, the second best day of my life if my uh, wife is watching. Uh, <laughs> oh my dear lord. I don't hate it. The finish on it is like spectacular. Aside from billet engine blocks, this is the biggest billet anything I've ever had and seen and held and seen. Nope. Nope. Yep. That's a lot of billet. Yeah. <laughs> I just need some billet injectors. <laughs> do they exist? I'm pretty sure they do. I've seen like methanol injectors and the yeah. body of them is like billet, billet. aluminium, like CNC anodized. I think that's some billet injectors. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> All right. So I've gone to put the new harmonic balancer on and it didn't fit because the bore is a little bit small. Now the crankshaft nose is pretty much 38 mil on the dot and these are typically you call them a sliding fit they're almost exactly the same size but tiny tiny bit bigger so that with a bit of force they just slide on but you don't have to press them on with a machine now this is just slightly under 38 millimeters which means you would have to press it and literally stretch that center ball uh, to get it to go on and probably never ever ever get it off again uh, so ross instruct us to use this bad boy, Dingle Ball, which is called a Flex Hone. Um, we, we, I've never used one before, but apparently you oil it up and you jam it in there while it's spinning and it really nicely hones it out to the size you need. So I guess we're going to find out and it's either going to work or we're going to make a really expensive mistake. Kind of like kids. Now that felt really aggressive. <laughs> I think it's not gonna take long for this to cut at all. It's actually nice. It's got like a nice cross hatch pattern in there. It looks 
legit. That's a cool tool. Cool tool. Cool, 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 cool. If it fits in here after fitting in the other one, we know it's the same size. Let's say they are now the same size. But we'll find out when you stick it on the uh, spare engine and see if it goes. All right, now it's still quite tight as it should be, so I'm gonna give it a little bit of persuasion and see if it goes on. It's uh, definitely gone further than last time, but it's still really, really tight. So I think we've got to give it just a, a wee bit more of a hone before it's that nice factory fitment. That's about as tight as the uh, factory ones are. Now I'll see if the, uh, no I won't see if the bolt fits in there because the bolt doesn't fit. I guess I'll just keep hitting it with a hammer. How many times do you hit a harmonic balancer with a dead blow hammer before you can be sure it's all the way on? Uh, it's good. I did a violence. Wouldn't you turn down the bolt first then? What? I don't have a lathe. We got all initial. <laughs> well I could. You know what, I absolutely could do that. I could linish this one down. It'll be really ugly. Hell, I could chop it down with an angle grinder. I didn't really want to ruin my original bolt. I guess I can kind of just be brutal to this one, just so I can use it for testing and um, make myself a nice pretty one with the uh, lathe I don't have later. Okay, let's go. Safety second. Results first. See that? I'm, I'm putting it on an angle so the action of the grinder makes that spin. It's like a half lathe, half grinder. It's a linder. A little bit of um, Project Binky style fabrication here. <laughs> They'll probably be really upset that I said that. Sort of fits, not yet. God damn it. Manufactured. What's the torque spec on this anyway? Was it in Uggers or Duggers? I can't remember if it was metric. Yeah, it was about 10. She's on. Over the weekend I started prototyping the oil pump bracket and this is what I came up with. Now this was the first one just to see if things would bolt on in the right spot and then we evolved the design a little bit to be slimmer and miss some things and finally I've ended up with this bad boy. So 
let's see if the uh, oil pump actually fits on there and everything works. Now this goes in uh, in here and acts as a tensioning mechanism and I've just got this uh, spacer because the um, bolt is too long. He goes in there and screws into that bracket. There we go. And you can you can see as I wind that it's pulling the bracket along and that will tension the belt up. And then on the underside, all the things fall out. That way. Yeah, that way. And then these bolts go through the pump and into the plate. Straight away looks like they're too long, but whatever. That's how you make bolts the right size. Okay, let's see if it fits in. I guess I'll just sort of put that there. Now way back in the beginning, I knew this day would come like three years later. <laughs> so we've machined this mounting point into the side of the sump that's got a little locating thingo shape there. It's like a rectangle doodad. And uh, it looks like it's kind of right in the right spot still. No, my plans haven't changed at all. So this is a small success story. Oh crap, that wasn't. Hey. I'll probably put that there now. Cheers, bruh. However, my 3D print is sort of splitting along here just a wee bit. So I might just put a safety zip tie somewhere. So if it does decide to drop it, it's caught by something. Around the nose of the oil pump. And there we go. That'll catch it if everything goes pear shaped. All right, and you'll also see I've um, made these spaces for the sway bar here. That's to drop the sway bar down so I can run the oil pump a little lower, which means we can still fit air conditioning in there because that's important. Um, but it doesn't upset the handling at all. We just need to make some shorter linkages for the other side of the sway bar and all the geometry stays the same. So that's the adjustment range now. Allows us to slip the belt on, in theory. There we go. Allows us to slip the belt on and then pull it out. Wonderful. That is pulling the belt tight. And everything's staying square. Blang, blang. Now for those of you with a keen eye, this is not a dry sump. Um, but we are running what looks like a dry sump oil pump. It's just been converted to be a wet sump pump, but run external from the engine. That's all done. Now, oil lines. Mm. There's a lot of way to cut this steel braided hose. My favorite is to put about five rounds of electrical tape around it to stop the braid actually fraying out from the cutting process. And then, uh, to be honest, I send a one mil angle grinder disc straight through the bastard. Now I've had to run this uh, hose in a bit of a loop, not a loop, a bit of a curve, 
uh, even though it doesn't actually need to curve to get from there to there, just so that the pump can um, go through its range of adjustment. It can sort of compress and extend the hose like bendy. All right, that's it for lines for now. I'm done with uh, engine stuff for a while, but I'm not done with billets. Come and have a look at this. Now that our engine is starting to come together and we know where things are going to be positioned, uh, it's time to start thinking about doing some wiring. And before we can wire, we really had to make a decision on what engine computer we're going to wire it all up to. Uh, in the end, we made a phone call to these guys, Mtron Australia, who sent us a KV16. It comes in a billet casing and obviously that has our project written all over it. It's billet. It's, look, it's majestic. It's, I would go so far as to say it is resplendent in all its billety goodness. Now, there are a lot of great ECUs out there. All of them pretty much have identical, massively long feature lists. Um, but in the end, we also believe that certain ECUs implement those features a little better than others, or sometimes a lot better than others. And this KV16 is right at the top of all of them. Now, uh, it's got some really good, unique things going on with it as well, including that it can run four drive-by-wire throttles. Uh, it's, it's quite unique, not many other ECUs can do that. And uh, I know we've only got one throttle in this car, but I do actually have plans to make use of all of those outputs to do some really cheeky stuff later on, but we will find out about that in some future episodes. Anyway, uh, what's most important is we need to do the wiring and we kind of need to figure out who's going to do it. It's kind of a, kind of a dick of a job. It's like really long and tedious. I mean, look, look, look at how many wires this thing has. It's like at least 7,000. So, um, I don't know. I might just sort of leave this here and just see what happens.